Well, I have the great privilege and responsibility of starting our first workshop before we've had a coffee break. So I hope everyone is awake and ready for the discussion this morning. Again, my name is Gail Hauck. Uh, I am currently a senior researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, but I spent about 20 years of my career in the nuclear industry um, working on commercial operating plants as well as new construction, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into the presentation. So, I'm going to ask everyone to do something that probably other presenters, thank you, have not asked you to do before. I'm going to ask you to take your phones out. Everybody take your phone out. Scan this QR code, or you can go to the website www.menti.com, and it'll ask you for a code to put in. And I would like you to engage on your phones throughout the workshop. This is a really big group, and unfortunately, it's not really possible for us to break out into little breakout sessions. But instead of that, we're going to be using, um, oh, I saw, I'm getting thumbs up already, awesome. Um, yeah, you can thumbs up for me uh, as we go through the presentation, too, so I appreciate that. That'll allow you to follow along with the slides on your phone, and um, we're going to have some Q&A interactive questions, get your thoughts as we go through the presentation. And we'll be using this uh, software for all of the workshop presentations for throughout today and tomorrow, um, so this will be kind of a test run for everybody to get to know how it, it works. If you have any questions or need help um, getting Menti to work, my colleagues from Oak Ridge National Lab, Andy Worrell and Ms. Dalia Lockridge um, in, the, in the blue shirt will be around and they can help you out as we go. So with that, let us jump right in, maybe. Okay. So in this workshop, I, I'm, I'm so glad that the, the speakers uh, talked a lot about the, the youth and getting women involved in the workshop, uh, in, in the workforce development, because these are really key opportunities. And I'm so excited about the promise that nuclear energy brings. I'm very passionate about bringing nuclear energy to new places because of the opportunity that it brings, not just for energy, but for jobs, for infrastructure, um, and for other, other opportunities for all the people of those countries. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, what some of the resources are, um, how you develop your education and training ecosystem um, to bring all that to bear, and then some of the options that will need to be considered for outsourcing and for collaboration. So what is a nuclear workforce? This is a Q&A question, if I can get the thing to work. All right, when you hear the words nuclear industry worker, what types of jobs do you think of? So this should, if you have the app up, you should be able to enter what you think Nuclear industry workers, what do you think of when you hear that? You can answer multiple things. So if there's a couple different things, you can pop those in there. I'll give you a minute. Science. Yeah. Oh, there, there we go. Engineer, engineering, nuclear scientists, design engineers, chemical engineers, scientists. A little bit of lawyers. Thank you for whoever the lawyer was that put that in. This is great. So you can see how this how this interactive software works. Um, that we can we can go. Oh, uranium operator. We got a lot of these very specific answers. Amazing. But you can see the ones in the center, and I don't expect this to change. Is nuclear engineer engineers engineering, scientists, all very technical jobs. But the reality is, when we look at what do we need for developing a nuclear program and operating a nuclear program, it's very diverse. Um, and we'll look at the specific numbers about the engineers and scientists a little bit later, but 
it's very diverse, and we need all sorts of workers. Um, one of my favorite ones on there for operations is divers. I didn't see divers on that, on that list, nuclear divers um, to do inspections underwater and repairs. Um, we need operators, we need welders, pipe fitters, um, electricians all sorts of different jobs to develop our nuclear workforce to deploy a nuclear program. So again, I'm so excited about this topic because a nuclear energy program doesn't just bring energy, um, although it does bring clean energy to help us address climate change. It also brings economic development. Um, it may be able to attract additional industries because of the availability of power that wasn't available before the nuclear program. And it brings all those different jobs that we just talked about from very basic labor uh, to highly, highly educated jobs, and they're good jobs. So I want to get some information from you. Like Alicia said, I want to learn from you as much as, uh, as you may learn from me. And I want to know about the pri priorities for nuclear in your country or region. Are you most excited about the clean electricity, heat, um, the economic development, or some of those job and workforce needs? Um, so in this question, it's a different type of question in Menti. You can uh, drag and drop the different options and you can sort them. You can just submit one or you can submit all three and what your rankings are um, for which ones are important, but once you hit submit, you can't go back and, and talk about the other ones, so. All right. So we are excited about clean energy and clean electricity, yes. Um, but a very close second is the economic development and all of the, the wonderful things that advanced, having an advanced industry and advanced technology uh, can bring to, to the nation. So the, the picture on the left is quite funny to me. It was one of my first visits to a nuclear construction site and that's actually a picture of me and Ms. Dalia Lockridge, who will be facilitating the second workshop. And that was taken about 15 years ago, not quite, um, but it was taken a very long time ago in the early in the construction of Vogel 3 and 4, um, which just came online and became operational in the U.S. last year and this year, which is very exciting for all of us. Um, but I ended up working at a construction site in the United Arab Emirates uh, at the Baraka APR 1400 four unit site for three years um, where I was in charge of, I was the deputy site manager for the Westinghouse scope uh, at the Baraka plant in the UAE. And UAE is a very, it's a very interesting country and it also their workforce development was very interesting because there just aren't a lot of Emirati people in general. A lot of the workforce and a lot of the population, and 90% of the population in the UAE are expats. Only about nine or 10% of the population in the country are Emirati people. So that came into play in the workforce of the Baraka site in a very interesting way. Um, and they tended to have nuclear experts from every country around the world that has a nuclear program. They all work together at the site on the same project. They had Americans, Canadians, Russians, um, South African, like anywhere there are there's nuclear plants, they had people from those countries that were at, at the site in UAE. And it was a really wonderful experience to see how they went from no nuclear expertise whatsoever to a very successful construction project with all four units being operational now. And I, I'll leave it at that, but I would love to have any questions that you have about, about that program as uh, when we get to the Q&A portion of, of the discussion. So, the question that I asked before, how many workers are needed during construction and operations phase? So let's think about, those are, 
it's a little different answer for construction versus versus operations, but we'll we'll talk about it once we get some numbers coming in. Because some of the numbers that I heard uh, Engineer Ohaga mention were about 20, looking to 200, and when we're talking about the engineering portion of the workforce, that's certainly relevant. Um, but we, yeah, these these numbers are good. I like that. So, so if we look at this, we can say the, the people that said 100 workers, uh, order of magnitude, that's correct if you're talking about just engineering staff. Um, during operation of the plant, when I worked at uh, a two unit uh, Westinghouse four loop PWR uh, in New York called Indian Point as a reactor engineer, we had about 1,500 people that worked on site, and during outages, it was around 3,000 people. Our, our population doubled during refueling outages. And I believe at the peak of construction at Baraka with all four units, there was about 25,000 people that were working at that site. It was a huge, huge, huge project. But I don't think most countries would make an attempt to uh, build four units all at the same time in their first time uh, building nuclear plants. It's a little bit ambitious. All right. Okay, so, so when are the workers needed? It's really important to think about the timing of, of the workforce development and the timing of when those jobs will be available because you don't wanna train up people and then not have good jobs for them because then they end up leaving, um, as Eric mentioned. And you don't want to have them sitting around either. Um, they need to be ready at exactly the time that they're needed, which can be really complicated and one of the places where outsourcing and collaboration can come in and support. Um, but you can get an idea here. The words are really small. Maybe you can see them on your, on your phone a little bit better. Um, uh, but on the left-hand side, you have pre-construction, uh, the next item is, is construction, and then um, operation, testing and, and operations at the end. So you can see you need a tremendous amount of workers, and not necessarily skilled workers. Um, some of them may be skilled, maybe it just be laborers doing, doing regular construction work, maybe pipe fitters. Uh, but these are the things that you need to think about where those workers are going to come from um, and how they can uh, be ready at the time that they're needed for the work at the plant. Okay, I love this slide. Because uh, this is really surprising to a lot of people. When we look at that piece of the pie that is for the engineering portion, it's pretty small in that, that dark blue section. 14%, and this is, this is just a typical example. It can vary a little bit between, between um, plants and utilities. When, when I worked at an operating plant, I mentioned there were 1,500 people that worked there uh, during normal operations. There were about 150 engineers that worked there, and of those 150 engineers, six of us were nuclear engineers out of 1,500 people. The only six that worked at the power plant were nuclear engineers. So when you're thinking about developing your nuclear energy infrastructure, everybody immediately thinks about nuclear engineers. You don't need that many. You probably already have all of the nuclear engineers that you will need, unless you're going to be designing and developing your own reactor concept. Most countries tend to use a, a partner to develop their, um, their reactor technology, and I'll talk about that in collaborations. But it's really important to think about, there's all these other different types of jobs and people that we need to get excited about nuclear that aren't nuclear engineers. Not that I don't love nuclear engineers, of course, but we need other, other folks too. Okay, so. Let's talk about what are the existing uh, workforces that are available and what are some of the other resources that we can pull in for our workforce development here. I need to be patient, I'm not very patient. 
So when we, when we start to assess our workforce capabilities, uh, we have to start with looking at the resources that we have, um, our, our available training facilities that can be used, other educational programs, and then we need to kind of look at the gaps between what do we have and where do we need to go to have a highly successful uh, nuclear energy program. One of the key things that needs to be thought about as well is what organization is going to be the owner operator. I'll talk about how that worked in the UAE in a little bit. Um, and then how are we going to recruit for those key organizations? There's, there's certain organizations, uh, and Eric mentioned some of these, the regulator, the owner, um, developing the safety culture, things that need to be put into place earlier than some of the other uh, recruiting and um, capabilities that need to be developed. And then finally, uh, sensitivity analysis. So the terminology, uh, maybe it's a little bit confusing, but with that, we're looking at if, if we're planning on building one uh, large unit and then we decide to build four small modular reactors instead, how is that going to change our workforce needs? Is it going to, how sensitive is that change or how sensitive is our workforce to that change? Is it going to need to be uh, you know, a totally different workforce or will it be similar to what we're already planning on? We need to know how changes in direction will impact the ultimate size of the workforce and is it a change that we could pivot to and, uh, and adapt to or not? So one of the one of the exciting opportunities is that there's a lot of commonalities between a nuclear workforce and some other workforces. Uh, there's a lot of commonalities in construction. There may be other opportunities um, where, uh, like in um, fossil fossil fuel energy, where they have already pipe fitters and welders and some of the other um, capabilities that are needed for nuclear energy as well. But there's also some very special and unique characteristics of nuclear energy as compared to all other forms of energy production. Um, and that is those nuclear uh, engineers. Other industries don't need those and they, they are very specialized. And uh, other things like operators, uh, radiological workers, there are certain things that, um, that we need or we need more of. And then the quality assurance and safety culture really requires a lot of time and training to be able to develop um, those programs. And so I'm glad in the, the Kenyan perspective that you're already working on that, that's great. So when we think about the recruiting life cycle, um, it, it really is a cycle and we need to be thinking about who's coming in, who's, who's leaving, are there other opportunities, um, are we bringing in enough people to address things like uh, people moving to other industries or retiring um, or other forms of attrition. So we need to set up these pipelines uh, of education and, uh, and vocation and bring them in. One of those special and unique things with the nuclear industry um, are these green boxes where even if a worker comes in that's already trained to be a welder, for example, when they come to a nuclear plant, they still need additional training on what's different about being a welder at a nuclear plant. What is special and unique about that? Um, and that, it could be a one day training orientation, but there's always some sort of training that needs to happen for every worker that's coming into those programs. Has anybody heard of this? Show of hands, anybody heard of a skill matrix? Oh, I see, couple, okay. Those are my colleagues waving in the back, <laughs> they don't count. <laughs> All right, so this is a tool. Um, this is a tool and a framework that you can use. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. It's just something that I wanted to introduce uh, that you can bring back and potentially use in the future. Um, and it's used to map the skills and level of competency that employees will need in different jobs um, as part of that workforce development. So it can really provide an excellent overview of the skills and competencies that are available in the workforce as well as things that may be missing and need to be focuses of recruiting efforts. 
So this is a little example of what um, like a pipe fitter, um, a, a template for a skills matrix. And I'll show you one that is filled out. So this is just a relatively simple one for a pipe fitter. And it talks about all the things that a pipe fitter might need to do as far as their duties and responsibilities. But I think the really important part here is what are the required skills and abilities and what is the education and experience that they need in order to fill that role. So once these things are, are created and developed for the industry, um, they can be used over and over again to help develop and retain and, um, and recruit some of the different types of workers that are needed. So as I mentioned, this is kind of, it's a framework and it's a process. We need to identify the skills that the different roles need, the levels of competencies for that. We put it in the skills matrix and then we look, at, look for gaps by comparing that to the existing workforce. And then it continues around through the whole recruiting um, and training process. Okay, education and training. I get excited about that. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm on like my, my fifth degree now. I think I've been in school all but seven years of my life. Um, so I get very excited about formal, formal education and training. Um, and hopefully you do too. So there's a lot of different types of options. We usually think of university programs, but there are many, many different types of, uh, of education that come into play when we look at developing a nuclear workforce. On-the-job training is really, really important, um, similar to an apprenticeship program, depending on what type of work it is. Um, qualification programs that specialize in getting people qualified for very particular things, like a radiation worker or um, a radiation monitoring technician. Obviously, we have our universities, and then I would be remiss if I didn't mention our regional clean energy training centers. So uh, again, my example from working in the United Arab Emirates, uh, this is how they had their uh, university, mostly university program, and then some of their on-the-job training that happened at the power plant. So their main university was Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, um, and this was a, a master's and PhD program, creating highly educated and competent uh, folks. They had a partner technical college called Abu Dhabi Polytechnic, um, and that was more focused on bringing in undergraduates that could then move on to Khalifa University or uh, providing professional certificate programs to get people trained for those very specific roles, um, like a radiation technician. At the power plant itself, um, there were the usual qualification programs for operators, radiation workers. Um, they also offered continuing education and requalification. And one of the, the unique things that they had, they called it emeritization. And that was their goal to keep the project moving by bringing in competent and qualified expat workers. And they would partner them up with a, um, with a local Emirati person who had been trained and educated but didn't have the on-the-job training to do the work. So often when I would interact with, um, with the owner of the utility, there would be two people. There would be a, a Romanian and an Emirati. And uh, they would work together. We would, we would handle everything together. And, um, and that's how they, they got their Emiratis trained up to take over those jobs from the other expat professionals that they had brought in. Again, partnerships. Um, the regional clean energy training centers are a, a great way to share some of those resources that we have available. Um, obviously, you are aware of those. Um, and offering those, those broader uh, educational programs and virtual programs is really, really useful for seeing not only what you need to, to do, but also maybe things that you hadn't thought of or considered in developing the program. One of the things that I didn't mention um, earlier when I talked about the development programs in the United Arab Emirates um, was they actually had a significant 
portion of, of women that worked at the plant, um, particularly in operations. And I think part of the reason for that was um, the a lot of the males in the workforce tended to work in the oil and gas industries because that was what they had a lot of before. And so when they needed to quickly develop a new workforce, they brought in the people that hadn't necessarily been considered for those types of jobs before. They brought in a lot of very highly educated, um, very enthusiastic young ladies that got trained up and became many of the leaders at, at the Baraka site. So sometimes we need to supplement our workforce uh, because we don't have the competencies or we don't have them at the time that we need them uh, to get things moving in our program. Um, and so this is very similar to in the recruiting effort. It's just, can you bring in somebody that already has all of the skills and experiences that are needed to fill that role? Um, so we wanna look at what those gaps are and what the future needs of the workforce are um, and use that to figure out those mission priorities, like I mentioned. If, if you have a, a long timeline, everybody can be trained up, but if you want to compress the timeline, it can help to bring in uh, outsourced staff to fill those gaps. So some of the things that need to be considered when we're looking at outsourcing is the types of services that are needed. Is it a job that needs to be done one time or short term or is it something that's long term? Um, I can give an example from Baraka where we brought in um, an expert in metrology to do some measurements of placing the, the lower barrel inside the reactor vessel. So it's a very large piece of steel going in another very large piece of steel and there's a very small tolerance around the outside and it needs to be exactly perfectly centered. Um, this is something that's done one time when the reactor is being constructed. It's never done again. So it wouldn't make sense to train someone up to do this work that they're only going to do once and then never again, or you know maybe a couple times if there's a couple of different reactors. So in this case, we brought in a worker. He did that measurement work over a two-day period, and then he flew back to his home, um, and that, that work was done and was completed uh, very quickly. So sometimes it can be actually less expensive to bring in someone for a very short, very specialty job than it is to train them up uh, indigenously. So some of those infrequent and specialist tasks, um, what is the availability and cost of those external folks? Are they, are they available and at a reasonable cost rather than and training up internal folks? Um, so just some of the, the things. And, and what's, what level of risk are, are you willing to take with either bringing in staff or, um, or training up staff to do this? So there are some constraints and, and some issues with using personnel that are outside of the organization. If you are always bringing in specialists to do certain jobs, then no one ever develops the competencies to do that. Um, that's a time where it can be useful to have kind of that buddy system, that on-the-job training to bring in an outside expert, but then be getting someone trained up to do that work if it's something that is, is ongoing and needs to be uh, continuously developed. Um, so, and as I mentioned before, it could be less expensive or it could be more expensive to outsource rather than training permanent staff. It just depends on the type of job and, uh, and the duration. All right, so finally, let's talk about collaborations, which are one of the most important parts. Uh, because we can't do everything on our own. We need help with certain things. Um, and collaborations is a great way to get people to focus on the things that they do best. Um, so determining the need and readiness for collaboration, um, recruiting the right people in the right organizations. Partnerships in the nuclear industry last for decades. And it's really important to make sure that those organizations that you're going to be working with for decades are ones that you want to be working with for decades. 
Um, one of the one of the most important, the key uh, steps is determining the structure of that collaborative partnership. Um, it may seem straightforward. I can tell you I've personally seen poor collaborative partnership structure cause a nuclear project to fail. I won't mention which one, but you can ask me later. Um, just because of the way that it was set up with this framework and the structure uh, was not conducive to proper collaboration. And then I've seen ones that have been very highly successful, again, in the UAE, and I'll, I'll show you what that one looked like. But it's very important to consider what the structure of that collaboration is going to be and then have a proper communication strategy and action plan to enact it. Okay. So I wanted to introduce this more generally and then I'll get into the specifics. Um, and I mentioned this briefly earlier. You'll tend to have some sort of utility management company that's in charge of owning, operating, or constructing uh, the nuclear power plants. That company will tend to work with a reactor designer vendor who that's what they do. They design reactors and then they sell them. There's tons of them. Um, and then both of those entities will use subcontractors to actually provide and procure the components that are needed to build the physical power plant. And then we have the regulator who is interacting with all of these different entities uh, and providing oversight. So this is, this is not the whole Baraka um, um, collaboration plan, but this is just the pieces that I personally worked on as the deputy site manager for Westinghouse there. Um, and you can see how those key pieces are there. We had Enoch, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Company, who was the utility and the owner um, that were stood up by their government. Uh, they partnered with KEPCO, a Korean firm, to provide the, um, the reactor vessel and to construct the project. And those two entities uh, formed a joint venture together called NAWA, um, and that was 82% owned by Enoch and 18% owned by KEPCO, and that was the company that was responsible for operating the plant. <coughs> Under, and then Fanner was the regulator who was watching over all of this. Under KEPCO, they had KHMP that was doing the commissioning and the startup testing work. Um, they had, as I mentioned, Westinghouse, we were providing the instrumentation and control uh, items, everything in the control rooms and out in the power plant. And Westinghouse was also a sub-subcontractor sub -sub to Doosan for heavy equipment, providing the reactor vessel internals and the reactor coolant pumps. In each of these different areas, we provided some of that contract, um, contract support. So the outsource personnel uh, were provided by Westinghouse that were embedded with um, our Korean counterparts, with KHMP, with KEPCO, helping them to uh, deploy and, and install the equipment that, um, that we had provided. So some of the advantages of collaboration, that increased expertise, that's, that's really the main one. Um, you can bring in expertise that's not available locally, and you can bring in excellence, um, technical excellence, where people can focus on what they do best, which can, as I mentioned, sometimes end up being less expensive than trying to do everything indigenously. Um, there can be challenges because of legal differences um, or uh, that's where we need to bring the lawyers in, as we mentioned, the nuclear energy lawyers. Um, and it's so, so important to think about how we want to collaborate up front uh, and make sure that that is instituted properly in all of the contracts and in legal space. So some uh, quick examples of that, um, ones that are ongoing in the U.S. We have the, the Dow X Energy uh, collaboration where Dow is a chemical manufacturing company. X Energy uh, is providing a reactor and, and the outcome of that is process heat and clean electricity for that industrial manufacturing process. 
Another example is the coal to nuclear program. I won't get into the details of that, but it's a really exciting idea and way of reusing some infrastructure and workforce um, in order to more quickly deploy uh, nuclear reactors. An example of this is the TerraPower Natrium Reactor um, that will be built in Kemmerer, Wyoming in the US. So in summary, we need to establish our goals for the program first and then what the workforce needs are to meet those goals. Uh, we can look at the existing local and regional capabilities uh, in terms of workers, in terms of training and qualification programs and educational facilities, like Eric mentioned, doing sort of a, a survey of everything that's currently available and then looking at those gaps. Um, we need to think critically about who are the partners that we want to work with to develop our program and then make a very solid collaboration plan uh, to make that happen. And I think that's it. I'm happy to take any questions and I'll invite uh, Eric to come up as well for questions. Thank you very much, Gail and Eric, for that very substantive and helpful presentation. Um, I wanted to take Das Duncan's charge that we put into practice sharing experiences and ideas and build on your very good presentation and note that among the tools in our collective toolbox is a program that I have the privilege of overseeing called FIRST, which is the Foundational Infrastructure for Responsible Use of Small Modular Reactor Technologies. It's a long name, which is why we have an acronym called FIRST. Uh, and FIRST uh, works very closely with our friends at the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, as well as NGOs, universities, as well as uh, U.S. National Labs, and then, of course, leveraging the nuclear experiences of more than 60 years in the United States of safe, secure, reliable nuclear power. And we seek to provide this expertise to partners all around the world. Uh, indeed, FIRST cooperates with almost 50 countries, including many here in Africa. Uh, one of our initial partners was actually Kenya, and I've had the privilege of working with Eric on some of the curriculum development projects that he mentioned, including both at the university level as well as for technical practitioners. And we're very excited, Eric, to support uh, Kenya's long-term workforce development needs. Uh, we're also very pleased to be able to partner with Ghana, uh, where we've established the small modular reactor control room simulator that was mentioned under the previous panel, as well as to develop a welding certification program, again, for tradespeople to also be able to have the necessary skills to support our shared economic and energy needs. And so um, I very much look forward to our discussion throughout the course of this week. Uh, my colleague, Mia, and I are, are here and happy to have side conversations on ways that potentially we can support both on a bilateral and regional basis, uh, these very important goals. So thank you very much for this uh, very important session, Gail and Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead in the back, and then we'll come to the front. So yes, back, back there, and then we'll come to the front. I'm the CEO of Innovations Park Africa, which is an innovation investment company in Nairobi. And I'm also a correspondent of African Young in Nuclear Energy. And uh, my question would be to the government of Kenya. But now that uh, it's evident that uh, the public is not so much aware about the peaceful uses of nuclear. Um, as I see it, I'm a correspondent. The African Young Nuclear Agency. But uh, I do write in Star newspaper at some points when I get any exciting news that I think the public should know about nuclear energy. But little do I have, have I ever heard the government of Kenya convening a public uh, media and a government agent, uh, I mean, organization or a, a meeting so that we organize together a proactive 
informatory uh, uh, plan. Now we can sensitize our public to know about the peaceful uses of nuclear. Would the government of Kenya perhaps organize such a plan so that the public can be uh, thoroughly be informed about the peaceful uses of nuclear? Otherwise, we, however good product or plans we have about nuclear, without sensitizing our people with the uses, good uses and peaceful uses of nuclear, then we, we cannot have a breakthrough. And the public cannot perhaps embrace the plans that the government has. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. And I would, like to, I would like to jump in and mention that we will be covering stakeholder engagement, which will go over a lot of that. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to get the Kenyan perspective on that as well, if that's okay, when we do that, that workshop on stakeholder engagement. Okay, there was a question up here as well. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Justas Wabuyabo. I'm the CEO of the new pair, the co-host. And uh, being my first time to stand up, I want to welcome all the delegates to Nairobi. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you, Delia, you mentioned something very interesting. And before I go that, I want to thank Eric and yourself for the very good presentation. Uh, you mentioned about um, the experience in Baraka, where you had people from Russia, uh, Korea, all over the world, basically. And that is very interesting. Uh, I'd just like to, maybe you could share with us, how was the experience working with very different nationalities? Uh, was there issues of language barrier? Mm. Were there challenges because of cultural, uh, uh, you know, way, the way people do things? And uh, did that help? Uh, in the delivery of the project faster? Or do you think that there was some, uh, uh, because of that different mix of people, did it affect the delivery of the project? And uh, would you really, s uh, maybe, uh, would you say that it, if, if you were to get like, maybe one, one uh, partner, would it be more advantageous? Uh, please share with us that experience. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Thank you so much. It was a very, um, it, and sometimes it could be a little bit challenging. Uh, they actually developed a procedure for Baraka English uh, to cover the specific English language that we would use at the site because, you know, there's many different English speaking countries and nationalities that were there. Um, you know, American English is different than the British English, is different than South African or Australian English. Um, so we had a procedure that dictated this is the proper Baraka English that we're going to use at the site. Um, and so communication wasn't too much of a problem, but I think everyone that works there, especially for myself as an expat, recognizing that I was a guest in the country and um, you know, there, and, and I would expect, I expected um, some cultural miscommunications and we just would work together until we were able to resolve those. Um, I think it, it lended a, a richness to the project that it would not have otherwise had if we didn't have all these different nationalities working together. But we all had the same goal. We all were there to get this power plant built. I, I wanted to see a nuclear plant start up for the first time myself. Um, we were all very passionate about making sure that the project was successful. Ultimately, I do think it was, uh, it did help the project to be able to be completed more quickly, um, but they didn't really have the, the option of doing it all uh, internally just because of the size of the, of the, the nation, which just was not large enough to, to develop enough workers to do that. Um, but it, it, it certainly was, was a really wonderful project to be a part of and to experience that and to have that opportunity to work with all these different nationalities that were all very excited and enthusiastic about nuclear energy and getting the, the project developed and built. Thank you for the question. We have other questions. Yes, over here. And then we'll come over here, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Lucalo, uh, uh, director, Kenyan director, research to empower. And uh, I think I have a ton of questions. Uh, 
but I better just try to cover what I can cover. So uh, this idea is all great, and uh, my major question is uh, Kenya, uh, being a country that is faced with a lot of corruption, uh, what steps will be taken to ensure transparency, accountability in Kenya's nuclear energy program, in case you're, you're going to engage with the stakeholders in Kenya, in terms of procurement and uh, operation, also to deal with matters conflicting interests. Uh, another question is that uh, how does Kenya plan to ensure the safe uh, and secure operation of nuclear power plants in the face of potential natural disasters or security threats? Have you maybe considered uh, maybe implementing climate uh, disaster risk financing and insurance? Uh, maybe you could uh, tell us. Also, another reason is that uh, maybe people may, be, may not be willing to uptake the idea of nuclear is because people don't have confidence in the government when delivering such initiatives. Because many great ideas have come before, but uh, they've all uh, languished. Kibera has the largest numbers of NGOs. So um, another question is that uh, you haven't touched really. How does Kenya plan to integrate nuclear energy into existing energy grid and infrastructure. I think that is a missing link because you don't start from scratch, right? You start from somewhere. So how uh, uh, are all these going to be integrated? Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me start with the easier one, which is the last one. We operate using <coughs> a national master plan which we call the least cost power development plan. And therefore, nuclear as a source of energy has been integrated in our national energy plan from 2011. This national energy development plan is updated every two years. The current least cost power development plan that we have is for 2024-2044. And in that particular plan, nuclear as a source of energy has already been committed to come on board by the year 2034. So it is planned for nationally, and it is a committed uh, source of energy. In addition to other sources of energy like hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, as you're aware, we have a lot of deposits of geothermal. And that is a base load for our country. And nuclear is going to form the second base load by the year 2034. So all this is planned for and integrated very well. And that's what guides our commissioning date in terms of deployment of the nuclear power program. In terms of safety and security, and this has been talked about all the time, if you look up, uh, at the 19 infrastructure issues, which as a country is what we have been evaluated on, we have been told that in the year 2016, we had our first email mission here, email is integrated nuclear review mission, that looks at how you have been able to perform in all those 19 infrastructure issues. And one of them is safety, security, and safeguard. Those three S's form part and parcel of those 19 infrastructure issues. And as a country, you must demonstrate how you'll be able to ensure that you deploy your nuclear power plant in a secure, in a safe, and optimal manner. So this is what the country is developing on this infrastructure to ensure that there will be no issues to do with those three S's in the future. In terms of corruption, I think this is all for us to answer that question. Corruption starts with you. It's the mindset issue. I think if we, all the laws in this, we have very good laws in this country tackling corruption. We have very good institutions in this country tackling corruption. But corruption is a mindset that all of us require to deal with. But I can assure you, in terms of the nuclear industry, that would not suffice. Because an accident in Kenya becomes an accident all over the world. And safety, security, and safeguard must be ensured. And no vendor will come into a country and compromise on quality that would actually 
derail that particular process. So for corruption, it's all of us to deal with that corruption. Even at your own place of work, at home, you need to ensure that we don't condone this particular vice. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is David Otuoma. Uh, I have only two questions, one for our host and another one for our visitor. So I think I'll start with our host. So uh, we are very privileged that you've explained we had about education, this is my question. Uh, we, are, we, have relationship, we have relationships with Korea, uh, we have relationship with China, and also you said the Institute of Nuclear Science in the University of Nairobi, but you forgot one. In 2011, uh, we started with the Texas A and M University of the United States, and every year we had agreed with the Texas A and M University will be sending their Kenyans. Actually, the first year in 2012, we sent 30 Kenyans, and we are supposed to continue sending more Kenyans. And the reason why I'm saying that, uh, the, there's, a, there's a state university in North Carolina, it's, it has a Pulsata uh, reactor, so there was an inter, internet reactor lab arrangement between North Carolina and Jordan. And that program made the International Atomic Energy Agency start something called International Reactor Lab. And in Kenya now, we are privileged. Kenyatta University is having that. So since we are privileged to have so many Americans here, because I've had, like now, for example, I've been privileged to be made the first president of the Nuclear Society of Kenya, which was registered last month. Why don't we relate with the Americans so that we get more of our young people, while still here in Kenya, having access to reactor. Uh, that is on the side of research reactor. And, and on the side of uh, this in a, uh, uh, industry readiness, uh, what we had started with Texas A&M, you expand it. Because in America, uh, between, I think, May and September, the universities don't have people. So you can send there a number of Kenyans, young people, not me, for me now, uh, I don't want to go there. The visa issue is not interesting. But young people, please, send young people. Then for the, our visitor, uh, here in Kenya we have the State Department, the embassy that is, and then yourselves you are coming by virtue of being in the Department of Energy. But we are missing a very important component, I think the Department of Commerce, because if Kenya was to have a one, two, three agreement with the USA, that is the only way we will get technology transfer. And technology transfer will come if we agree with that one, two, three arrangements with the uh, US government. Right now, there are only about 27 countries in, in the world which have signed one, two, three agreements with the USA. But if Kenya signs that one, and the Department of Commerce is also here, then all the companies in the USA will be very much willing to sign MOUs, partnership agreements, you talk what you want to say with our farms here in Kenya, and then this technology transfer will come to pass. Because in my mind, uh, I think we need, like personally now I'm teaching at the University of Nairobi Physics, much as we need the knowledge, we need the technology transfer and then the investment so that we can realize our dream of having nuclear in our lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tuomo. In regards to Texas A&M, and I must admit I'm one of the graduates of Texas A&M, the one-month training there. And as a country, we are actually making very deliberate efforts to revive that particular training fundamentals in nuclear engineering. But I must also say that I'm happy that under FAST, and Brian has uh, made some commitments there that from next year, we will be coordinating with Texas A&M uh, if this is approved by FAST in curriculum development. And uh, through some selected universities and technical institutions, we'll be sent to Texas A&M to be able to achieve this mandate. So together with curriculum development from Texas A&M and also reviving of that fundamental trainings that we had initially uh, published. So I think that would give us some impetus in terms of HRD development. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I will not comment on the U.S. <laughs> SWIN 123 agreements. Um, there's there's actually several different processes that that need to happen to, to work together, but your point about uh, inviting the Department of Commerce is, is well taken, so thank you. Other questions? One in the middle. One in the back. We'll do it in the middle, and then in the back of the middle first. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Mangala. I'm a teacher, lecturer at the University of Nairobi at the Institute of Nuclear Science and Technology. And uh, I've listened to your presentations. And, well, we plan to have a, a nuclear power plant. Now, you made a presentation on uh, Barak. Can you please tell us about the structure of the owner and operator? Because we would also like to have a similar and also in addition, perhaps give us a, also an overview of the kind of power plant, how they are structured in the US. To me, it looks like it's business business of selling electricity. So therefore, it should therefore attract people who are into the business of uh, IP, where, what is it? Independent IPP, we call them IPP, yes. So how would we get this particular issue actualized in the setup of the owner and operator? Because I see from the government point of view, this kind of business might not attract a lot of investment, specifically from the government. But from the independent operators, I think there's a lot of business in Africa, because everybody has expressed the same interest to have a electricity available. Thank you. OK, thank you. as well, if you like. Um, excellent question about the, the structure of the, the owner-operator in the UAE. Um, for Baraka, as in, um, with m many countries, the owner-operator was set up by the government, so it was a semi-autonomous semi uh, government entity, basically, uh, that was owned and controlled by the government, which is, as you mentioned, quite different than the structure that we have in the U.S. And um, I'm afraid we might need to give an entire other workshop on all the different ways that the electricity, the grid, um, and the business of energy development in the U.S. Um, work, because it's very different if you look at um, the grid and operation and the business in the Northeast U.S. It's different than in the South. It's different than in Texas. It's different. It's different all over the country in terms of whether they use the PPAs or not. Um, but we'd be happy to have a conversation about that um, later on. <coughs> I think there's a lot of advantages with the the owner operator being. Um, a designee of, of the government, especially for nuclear programs, just because of the, the special and uniqueness of, of what's needed and just the size of being able to develop that program. Um, I can share with you the kind of the perspective of the Emiratis in the UAE. Um, a lot of people ask when they started to build that plant why they were bringing in nuclear energy when they have so much oil available to produce their energy. And, um, and the feedback that, that I understood was that their, their leadership looked ahead for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. The oil will run out and they will still need energy and they'll also need jobs and industry. And they thought, they believed the best way to bring that into the country was by developing a nuclear energy program. So they had that ability because of the government structure and because of the structure of the entity, they had that ability to take that long-term view and to develop this program strategically 
to create an industry that didn't exist, to create jobs that didn't exist, and to make sure that they would have a security of energy even once the oil runs out. Did you have anything you wanted to add from Kenyan perspective on this? Okay, thank you so much. I think in regards to the owner operator, as you know, there are critical uh, institutions that are required in the deployment of a nuclear power program for any country, and Napier is one of them, uh, which is responsible for developing of the requisite infrastructure. And then you have the regulator, which is already established under the Nuclear Regulatory Act of 2019. What we have not established as a country is the owner operator, and we have already done some strategies for establishment of the owner operator for the country. And I think in the next few years or few months, we will be, the government of Kenya will be actualizing exactly the establishment of the owner operator, depending on the strategies that will have been presented to the government. Thank you. Um, we, d we did, can we just take the one more in the back that I, okay. Last question in the back. Yes. No, no, the, 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 yeah, that one. Yes. Okay, I'll just be very quick. Thank uh, you, please. My name is uh, Chantal Loititu, recent graduate mechanical engineering from the University of Nairobi. Um, engineer Flora Kamanja, I don't know if she's here, but she's a very good mentor, and she's the one who's trying to get me together with Mr. Eri, engineer Eric Ohanga, <laughs> and I'm glad that you're, in the space of nuclear, because we worked with you when you were president at IK. So I know a lot of youths are going to benefit a lot from it. But as we're here, I've also seen the CEO of Nupea. I feel like this question is for both you and him. Um, on the opportunities that are available for people who are not yet in the, who are not in the universities, but have left universities for the trainings, et cetera. How are you going along with updating online, especially for the communities who are online? Thank you. When my CEO is around, I don't answer that question. I give it to my CEO. So CEO, please, can you say something on that? Opportunities for the young people. Uh, thank you very much for that question. I think it's a very important question. Uh, uh, and in part of this uh, workshop, we'll have a session for gender and, and youth. Huh? And a lot of that will be answered. But let me, uh, let me try attempt to just answer you now. Uh, we will not develop this nuclear program without having the young people in mind. Because as uh, Professor Thomas said, uh, his time and our time is up, is up. By the time we'll be doing the construction in 2027, it will be the young people. So our focus is to start tapping into the young people. And uh, as uh, was presented, what we have tended to do is to look for people who are already working in the sector and we get them opportunities to go and work at plants or nuclear plants or countries with that technology so that they learn. But we cannot sustain that forever because uh, when we need more people to work, you've had, uh, I've always thought about 1,000 people, but now we're being told we may, we're talking about 10,000, 20,000 people work in nuclear power plants. We will need to, to develop a lot of these people here. And there is, the government has committed to this program. And therefore, we will start developing curricula to train these people here, and we will be creating opportunities for our young people to start having careers in the nuclear, in the nuclear plants. Um, also what we are doing is that there are opportunities, and uh, I'm sad that uh, Professor Shaukat has left. Uh, under the IEA, we have a number of opportunities that keep coming up, and for the young people here, I will encourage you that before you leave, please go on the website of the IEA, especially young women. There are very many opportunities there, and uh, we can help you to get internships and job opportunities with IEA so that you can start uh, getting first-hand experience. Uh, we also have um, a partnership that we are going to develop, and I'm also sad that uh, DG Magud is not here, but uh, NIA, 
the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is uh, an organization in Europe under the OECD. Uh, they have, uh, they're coming in to partner with us, and we should actually be able to see how we can also get young people, our Kenyan young people, to get opportunities to work in uh, those fields. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that was a really wonderful way to round out the session. Um, and I just want to reflect back to Alicia Duncan's words, Das Duncan's words at the beginning of the session for the young people that are here about mentors. I would not be standing up here and giving this presentation to you without all of the mentors that I had had through my career. And almost, I can say 100% of the mentors that I had successful relationships with were all people that I asked them to be my mentor. They weren't assigned to me by my boss or anything like that. They were someone that I saw them doing amazing work or they knew something that was really interesting and I went up and I asked them just to tell me about it. So please do take those opportunities while we're here this week to have those conversations and make those connections um, and develop yourself as we are going about developing the workforce. So with that, I will turn it back over to our wonderful moderator. Right, a round of applause for Joelle and Eric. Thank you, thank you so much.